Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to KSP to Mars, the show by Lorenzo, who you all know and love. And today we are actually going to Mars and we're doing it manned. We are bringing this rocket, which is basically a big pile of Delta V with a little bit of science tacked on top. Totally, if in total we'll have more than 22 and a half kilometers per second of Delta V and that's largely due to the heavy use of this one nuclear engine here. We're carrying four side stages, of well, most sort of side tanks. These two are expendable, they are meant to last until we touch down on the red planet. Here you can see they have the parachute and they will help with that. Then upon ascent they will uh, separate away or yeah, they listen. Listen, there is more purpose to this madness. There is a method. Um, these two things have two big parachutes. The capsule itself has smaller parachutes. We're going to go in on the heat shield first. Then when we slow down, we ditch the heat shield, deploy the parachutes. Now, if these parachutes turn out to be too strong, they can be safely ripped off the ship. That's the point at any rate. And if we're going slowly enough, we can separate these tanks assuming they're empty of course, and land gently on the nuclear rocket and the landing struts here. Then we have all the science conveniently positioned so that a Kerbal that for a change will have a ladder, look at that, a Kerbal can go out onto the Martian surface, walk around, grab the science and get back inside his capsule. Now if that's not designed and I don't know what is, then of course this whole assembly is going to fly back home hopefully bringing with it many many thousands of sciences because everything is going to be returned and the capsule can then make its final unassisted re-entry back home on earth a hugely ambitious mission of course and we'll see in which hilarious way it will go wrong or who knows we might succeed first up though is the launch and as you're accustomed to i am not going to show you that because if you want to see a launch scroll back a few episodes and well, have a look at the episode that says uh, introducing a new launch vehicle or whatever. And here we are, sending John Frid Kerman on his intrepid voyage to the Red Planet, from which he will, if all goes to plan, return with boat loads, or should I say capsule loads, full of science. Now, the beauty is that because this, the payload of this, well, craft, if you can call it, it's just a capsule really, we selected the Kerbal that had was the least social and didn't really need anything because he's not going to get anything. The beauty of this Deinonychus engine that goes on the liquid methane is that it's quite good. It's got 368 seconds of specific impulse even in space, well especially in space, and while that is not as good as the 800 that the nuclear engine offers, it is still like almost half as good. And the fact that this upper stage kicks us off into the tra into the transfer trajectory with well several G's instead of several fractions of a G uh, makes all the difference because they make the trajectories you plan from the the map screen from here uh, all the more accurate because the well the maneuver node it assumes an instant application of force on well the point where you put the maneuver node now this is of course still not that but the faster you apply your delta v the closer you approximate that um, that, well, that hypothetical scenario. So yeah, that, that makes it good. And I'm st again activating the nuclear engine the careful way so as not to blast these side, uh, so as not to blast these side tanks with the cowlings of the engine. Now, for all I was talking about how wonderful that rapid injection is, of course, it still only accounted for half of the Delta V and now we're relegated to a 10 minutes burn, 12 minutes actually, from the nuclear engine. Still though, it is a lot better than doing everything from the nuke engine because you can see this trajectory, it already, well, it's, the benefit is not as great as I would have hoped. Anyway, it's still a benefit. It's just not as amazing as I was going on about. For that, we would have needed a little bit more methane fuel. Right, 10 minute burn coming up. I will see you when we're approaching Mars in about a year. Yeah. So here we are and wonderful things are afoot. We are in the Martian system, if only just. Let's see if we can actually find the red planet. It will be small from this distance. Um, let's point the ship right at it. And have a look. Yes, there, way over there it is. 
And now, of course, comes the responsibility of performing science in space high over Duna. Let's see what the mystery goo has to say about that. 53 science if I return it. Well, we're going to pass by this way when we leave, so I'm going to, well, save those one-time experiments for when we're actually on the planet. But, of course, it never hurts to do a gravity scan. Now, I took one from uh, space in the solar system as well, and... I can store those in the in the capsule, but if you look at the egress hatch, it's a little bit obstructed, so I didn't dare put John Frit outside. So I'm going to store this in the gravioli meter until we're safely down on the surface, and hopefully then he can access that data. Same with this one, of course. Now this is information that we do have already, uh, however we haven't recovered it yet so that's what we're trying today so let's keep this as well and I'm already feeling that I um, didn't take enough gravioli scanners or did I? Let's have a look. It's a, it is unfortunate that the magnetometers are broken in such a way that you cannot really take data out of them so yeah I'm, I'm doing the science but there's no way these are coming back to Earth, so I didn't think that through all the way. Now, on to the more exciting part of this mission is, of course, the entry into the Juna atmosphere. I put the periapsis at 50 kilometers. That should uh, slow us down sufficiently to enter orbit, at least if our previous experiences have uh, anything to do with that, that should be all right. So I'm going to inflate the heat shield what the heat shield has a display. What can that display? Minus 200. That's the temperature of it. Oh, that's the temperature of it. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, inflate the heat shield. So let's open that up and then barrel down into the planet. Look, it obscures just about everything. Wonderfully done. So what's going to happen is we're going to slow down on the heat shield, then decouple it, and then try to turn the ship around on its reaction wheels and then pop the first set of parachutes and then the second one. I've staggered them so that they don't all open at once, killing the ship. Then we'll have a look at what our speed is. And if needed, we will use the rocket engine to slow us down further. Um, these tanks are... Uh, no, these tanks are not quite empty yet, so I'm going to try and leave them attached to the rocket. I think that without this heat shield, our Kerbal will have no problems exiting the rocket. Uh, if that does become a problem, they will have to be ditched somewhat full. So far, though, the mission is looking good. And I hope that remains. It remains that way, because then we are going to get lots and lots of science, which is, of course, of important, but we're also going to set a milestone event where John Frit Kerman will be the first... Oh, stop, 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 less time warp. What? That was a hyperspace ride. <laughs> where John Fred Kerman will be the first of his kind to well, set foot on Mars, which is wonderful. You might be thinking, why the hell are you forgetting to do science in space near Duna? Uh, oh, I can do the temperature science, of course. I'm forgetting it a bit, but the Gravioli... Oh, I'm not in space near Duna yet. The Gravioli scanners, they are full at the moment, so... Eh, that makes no sense. If I'm going to take this with me again... No, this will definitely make it to space near Duna. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, this this second stage with all the science has 5.5 kilometers per second of delta V. So that's coming all the way back up. Wonderful. So in that case, nothing is wrong. We only need to wait and do our um, our thermometer reading while we are actually uh, in space near Duna. And that will be horrendously close, probably. Unfortunately, due to the nature of orbital mechanics, we will be entering uh, on the dark side of the planet. But hopefully the re-entry heat will, well, prove sufficiently bright to see science equipment by. Oh, that's nice. No electric charge for the reaction wheel system. That is wonderful. That's just great. Um, we didn't lose control. I obviously didn't bring any batteries on this expedition. That is a wonderful, oh, terrific problem. That means that... Oh, shit. How is this ever going to remain stable? I hope that the, that the heat shield will be able to do it. I did bring a solar panel. And I don't know what ate the electricity. Was it the reaction wheel? 
I don't have anything that requires on that requ requires electricity on an ongoing basis, and I have a crew member that can you know do these things. I can do this, but obviously that's not going to do anything here in the night side. I can fire the engine a little bit. Good, that gives us a little bit of power, enough to orient the ship at any rate. And ooh, yeah, that's not that's that's done it already. I'm spending fuel running it through the nuclear reactor to generate electricity with an alternator to orient the ship in a proper way so as to enter. Oh dear, this could very well be the 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 flaw that breaks the mission. Let's have a quick let's have a quick look how the center of mass is oriented. We will of course have a lot of drag on this bit. The nuclear engine is heavy but otherwise most of the mass is fuel which is fairly central. So I'm hoping that the shape will be stable enough to well re-enter in an orderly fashion and not tumble out of control. We will not in fact have our um, reaction control wheel to do that. On the other hand if things do start to get horrible we can fire up the engine, get some power and use the reaction control wheel from that. Uh, not ideal, but it is something we can do. For now though, let's take a temperature scan, because that's what I was wanting to do. 28 science, keep that, wonderful. Did we ever do a goo container here, of a materials bay here? Let's have a look at that. 147, now I'm going to save that for the surface as well, as you might imagine. So, yeah, something is, is leaching 0 0.01 electricity. I don't know what it is, but let's fast forward and see what happens when and if we hit the atmosphere. Well, it's not really a question of if, it's more a question of what is going to happen. No power for the reaction control wheels and an engine that can generate power, but will also then thrust forward, which is, of course, incredibly counterproductive. This is the most exciting part of any mission to date, because we are landing a man on Mars, which... Well, it's awesome. I don't have to explain why. That is awesome. 180 kilometers now. About to barrel down into the atmosphere and there we have it. I'm going to fire the engine just briefly to generate some electricity and to, of course, steer the ship into the, well, the, the prograde vector so that our heat shield may do it. So, cutting the engine out. And, well, we are definitely in physics mode. And I'm expecting to see, well, slowing effects. We have 0.3 kilonewtons on the heat shield already. And, of course, I sincerely hope that we will not be exceeding the G-tolerance for John Frid. We are coming in at 6 kilometers per second. And if I recall correctly, that was a, a whole lot less for the care package that was sent over a few episodes ago. That was coming in at about 3 kilometers per second. Maybe that was a, a much more inefficient interplanetary transfer, where if you well, have to um, burn normal or anti-normal whilst in solar orbit, you will spend more delta V, but you will come in, you will rendezvous with your target planet, in this case Mars, at a lower relative velocity. Because, well, you did like half of your circularization burn already. I do wonder if this is going to turn out alright. I hope so. I hope so. But the no electricity bit is definitely a nasty surprise. Or let's call it what it is a design oversight. I'm trying to find the atmospheric sensor that I have here. Logging the pressure data. Well, the atmosphere isn't thick enough for that yet. We can all do that at our leisure when we are, in fact, in the atmosphere. Or when, we, when we are through the, what is called in real life, the six minutes of terror, or at least NASA calls it that. Yeah, I wonder if we're going to make it. I hope so. This heat shield has proven to be... Wait, display no power? Does this need power to do anything? I'm going to fire the engine just so we can have a little bit of power. <laughs> this is ridiculous. No power, yes. Okay, as soon as we're st going to start to drift, I'm going to just gently tap the throttle to generate electricity for the reaction wheel to then steer steer the ship into the wave, as it were. So far, though, it seems as though our orientation might be stable. Of course, this is a wide base that is going to help. I can't really see that flipping over, but hey, you never know what's going to happen. We are slowing down. We have 90 kilonewtons, and we are experiencing, well, not quite a G yet, but it's it's getting there. 
and let's have a look how this performs. Our craft, can we see the mass of it now? I'm not sure how this compares to the to the care package I sent over earlier. I hope this is going to be a, a nice, smooth, no questions asked, no hassles re-entry. Well, not a re-entry, obviously, an entry. And, well, no power for the display. But we're getting a lot of drag, we're still falling. Yet the deceleration is a gentle one. And it does appear as though this craft is stable under entry into the Martian atmosphere. That is all good news so far. Let's see if we can do a see if I can do an atmospheric scan that would be wonderful no power oh, of course not because there's no power right well I'm not going to fire the engine for that look there we have it wonderfully doing it John Fred is starting to feel the G's now going up to three G's almost and let's grab the Kerbal engineer are we in a no we are not quite captured yet, but yeah, we are at least captured. We're not leaving the Martian system. And we are just about to reduce our orbit into a impact trajectory. That's all good news, because that's what we want. We don't care where we're going to land, because, well, we don't have any bases, only debris fields, and nothing from that needs to be recovered, obviously. Let's take the, the surface reading. We're 44 kilometers above sea level. Of course, we don't really have seas on Mars, but they use a datum, which is basically the average height of the surface. I think it's the average, at least. So, yeah. Everything so far still looking good. The heat shield. I don't know if these have, like... Uh, the the heat shield on the pod has like ablation points. This one does not have it. If I fire the engine, I will get some electricity. It's at 455 something. Which I think is still well within tolerances. But then again, it's hard to guesstimate tolerances for some things when you don't really know what's going on. Yeah. So we're still at 4.4 kilometers per second. But everything is still looking stable. We're approaching our periapsis now. But... Yeah, it does look weird. We still have an apoapsis of about three and a half thousand kilometers, but it does look as though we will reduce that to a manageable level. And if not, we are not on an escape trajectory, then we'll just loop around and enter on the next go. Again, so far, everything definitely seems to be so good. And it only appears to be a little while now before we are... Uh, we are so low that we will, in fact, not be in orbit anymore. Let's have a look. Orbital velocity here is thus about 3.5 kilometers per second. And if we may look to the future, we can make a quick estimation of our delta V requirements. We will need about, let's say, 4 kilometers per second to get back in orbit. The atmosphere is so thin, I'm not expecting much losses from that. Um, that means that after this, if we don't spend any fuel landing, we'll have about 4.9 Let's be generous and give it 5 kilometers per second to get back to Earth. I think that's manageable. We should be able to do it. So delta V-wise, everything is looking good. The heat effects have stopped now. I don't know why. Because we're still being decelerated pretty roughly. But, I don't know. Did something break? Are we going so slow that it's not worth doing heat effects for? I think so. The drag is, re is is the drag is getting less, even though we're losing altitude. So I think the the stressful bit has definitely come and gone harmlessly. So let's have a look at our surface readout. Now, what happened to the care package was that when all the parachutes deployed, uh, everything got torn apart. Now I don't want this to happen this time, obviously. So I'm not going to be too careful in using the rocket once we are at, like I don't know. 10 to 5 kilometers. I'm just going to give that a good a good couple spurts of rocket power so that when the parachutes do deploy we're not traveling at breakneck speed and we can uh, well land safely which is of course what we want. I'm not quite done with the heat shield yet of course this, the next step in this fabulous entry will be the, the ditching of that. Now this is the part that will generate the most drag so when we ditch it it's not going to go away from the craft. I'm going to try and rotate, which for which we will need the engine because we need 
electric power for control authority and then when we're rotated I'm going to try and deploy the parachutes at which point of course the uh, heat shield is not going to keep up we're not going to keep up with the heat shield I hope yeah that's a good question actually whether the semi-deployed parachutes will provide more drag than this big floppy heat shield then again once it's detached it might not stay like this and just flutter down like some leaves or something so that should all be fine everything should be fine and life will be good rosy and John Frit will have a happy year on Mars let's see how long that's going to be a year and 120 days then that's when his transfer window back home opens up so yeah this is going to be a while more I'm going to cut the video here and I will resume that when we are um, in a position that I spoke about when we're just about to decouple the heat shield so see you in a bit yeah and here we are again not quite as far progressed into the re-entry well into the entry I keep saying re-entry it's automatic um, into the entry at Mars as I would have liked but things are heating up and not in the heat shield kind of way but in the excitement kind of way look we have two kilometers per second of speed we have 200 meters per second of vertical speed we have 28 kilometers of altitude remaining and no significant heating so I'm thinking at this point the parachutes will probably provide me with a more efficient way of slowing down. However, if not, I'll be screwed. But I don't have a lot of time to think about it anyway, so I'm just going to go ahead and try that. Let's separate the heat shield. Here goes that. <gasps> Ooh, that was not the heat shield. That was, in fact, these stupid engine cowlings. Fortunately, they didn't appear to have done a lot of damage. Uh, here goes the heat shield, then. What? Well, I suppose that's gone. Um, wonderful. Let's see about turning this ship over. We're going to use engine power for that. And at this point I feel comfortable deploying a parachute. Let's have two parachutes. Yes, they have everything what was looking so wonderful. It's not doing that anymore. The parachutes are overheating. Wonderful. Why? Why, why, why? Okay, they're not really overheating. What I need to do is turn around this ship needs to turn around because otherwise it's going to turn around violently whenever these parachutes start get generating drag okay okay ditching the heat shield was definitely definitely premature look at that heating that we're getting now because we are losing altitude this was uh, a bad idea yeah our parachutes are heating up we're still going way too fast oh uh, God, I may have just ruined that. Ruined that. I think I have. I need to turn this ship around. Things are exploding. What is exploding? I need the thrust from this engine to turn around. And then we'll have a look at what exploded later. I think it was the parachutes. Fortunately, I have more. And I also still have a rocket. So, yeah. The aerodynamic properties of this craft are not great. We are slowing down, though. Uh, we are at six kilometers, barreling towards the ground like a fucking something that's on fire. Oh, God. Oh, no. It's also the parachutes that were supposed to take John Frit home safely. Oh, God. Oh, we have parachutes. We have parachute deployment. I'm firing the engines. We are crashing down to the surface. How on earth? earth did this go wrong no oh yeah the, those parachutes they just they just snapped everything into pieces jeez landing on mars is hard let's think for a for a moment what went wrong obviously i shouldn't have ditched the heat shield we were only through the first period of intensive heating but even if I I had kept the heat shield, of course it would have gotten a lot more deceleration. Maybe then everything would have been fine. Ooh, that is a hard question to answer. Oh, John Fred is dead. That's for sure. Staring out into the red wastes here. I could have done more with rockets. I could have established orbit first, but that takes a lot of delta V. I could have put the Periaps is even higher for a longer longer path through the atmosphere. I think I could have gotten away with 60 kilometers, 65 maybe. 
definitely more when taking a, taking account taking into account the fact that more than one pass is definitely okay. So for the next Kerbonaut that goes there, I'm thinking same craft, but with more batteries so we can maintain control. Same heat shield, higher periapsis, and no dying. Absolutely no dying. Or I could attempt a one way mission that could just judiciously use rocket fuel to not have to use that very, very thin atmosphere to slow down by. Because that's really the killer. That atmosphere is super difficult. It's 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 thick enough that that it will burn your craft, yet it's thin enough that it won't slow you down before you reach the ground. Yeah, so 70 kilometer ish Fortunately, we've focused the program so we don't have to muck about with millions of probes before we're going to do this again. In the next episode, we're not quite immediately returning to Mars. In the next episode, we're revisiting the plan of previous episode. That is a lunar miner and hopper. And I've designed that already. I will show you. And then if you're watching this uh, way in the future, you can immediately click on the next episode to see that. Otherwise, you're going to have to wait a little bit... Uh, where did I put that? Lobby shuttle number three. This doesn't have the big launcher underneath yet, but that's the same for every launch. So I'm sure you can imaginatively, imaginarily add that in. Look what we have here. Same idea, except the different refinery. I looked it up on the internet and this is the one we need. The inline one doesn't have the mining capability. It has just refining capability. If you ask me, that's dumb to have these two parts separately because this one weighs two and a half tons and is very picky on how it lets you attach things and the other one is two tons is in line and is only processing i suppose there is a different niche for that but the difference is so small that i don't understand how that worth how that's worth it two rockets now might look a little bit like overkill they are very large they do resemble srbs but they're basically fuel tanks again same idea going to launch them very very empty and we'll set down on the moon, have this thing mine, refine, refuel this beast so that it may uh, proceed to make m numerous uh, lunar hops. It has a science package here and this time I added seismometers as well so that even if it becomes stranded it will be a seismic station. Nuclear transfer stage and under that is going to be the big booster that will put it into orbit. Check back for the next episode to see what is going to happen with that. I hope you enjoyed this day's failure and it's proven to be quite a string of them. So no science, no fusion drives. I'm working to get the fusion drive that will hopefully allow everything to be much much better but no such luck as of yet so have a wonderful day a nice life and i will see you in the next episode where hopefully we'll get some successes yeah i'm lorenzo goodbye <laughs>